Seven and two losses, an earned run average of 2.08. And for the New York Mets, Dwight Gooden with a record of two and one, an earned run average of 1.50. Well, hi, everybody. I'm Ralph Kiner, along with Fran Healy and Tim McCarver, coming your way from Shea Stadium on a beautiful night for baseball. Temperature right around 70 degrees, and the Mets taking on the Houston Astros for the first time this year. Mets started their action here tonight with a even record with the Chicago Cubs. The Cubs winning their ball game against San Francisco today, so the Mets are technically one half game back of Chicago. And it's the Mets against Houston. Last year, for the first time, the Mets beat Houston in a season series, winning eight of the 12 games they played. And on the mound for this ball game, we have the other Negro, the one that says he has a T-shirt that says, I'm Joe, I'm not Phil. So the other Negro, Joe Negro on the mound, and they both are outstanding pitchers. And going for the Mets, Dwight Gooden. Dwight Gooden, well, so far this year, he's won two, and he's lost one. So, Fran Healy, that's the story. And, Ralph, quite a contrast in pitching styles. You mentioned Joe Negro with... He's a knuckleball pitcher. 95% of the time you'll see the knuckleball, though. Tonight the wind is not blowing out. Usually when the wind's blowing out, the knuckleball is more effective. No wind really tonight. So it'll be interesting to see how effective Joe Nico's knuckleball really is. And as I mentioned, the contrast in style, Dwight Gooden, outstanding fastball, great curveball, great command of his pitches. One guy's 40 years old, Joe Nico, the other 20 years old. And right now, let's go down to the field and Tim McCarver. Thank you, Ralph. Fans, do you remember the song by the Beatles? They wrote and performed The Long and Winding Road. Well, that's the road that Clint Hurdle has taken to get him back to the big leagues. Well, thank you. I don't know whether it's persistence or lack of ability to do anything else right now or have a desire really to do anything else. I've, I have believed in myself throughout my career. I think that's one of the reasons I still kept my foot in the door. And I, I was fortunate enough to catch on with a quality organization like the New York Mets. They had kept tabs on me through my wanderings other places. And one thing I've kept pride in doing is always doing my best. It hasn't always worked out the way a lot of people thought it would, but I have always given it my best shot. And I've been a student of the game, and I've been a winner. So uh, I'm happy to be here, Timmy. I am really happy to be here. You gave it your best shot the other night on that throw in the 10th inning to nail George Hendrick of, uh, of the Pittsburgh Pirates. Well, it was one of those do-or-dies in, in, in an outfielder's you know, uh, standpoint. The, the ball was hit to me sharp and clean. I think I got the dry side of the ball because it was, it was raining at the time. I knew I had him. As soon as I caught the ball, I've been blessed with a good arm, and I've thrown, I've, I've thrown the ball well in the outfield when I've played out there. You know, even though you come in, You've been on the bench for nine innings or whatsoever. You have to make sure you're ready. And uh, I, I was ready. I was ready to play. I'm always ready to play. And uh, I got the opportunity. The throw was there. And Gary put the wham on him at the plate. And it worked out well. There was a lot of other great plays, though, in that game. If you got the dry side of the ball, you must have hit the wet side of the ball in the 18th inning, huh? <laughs> well, I tell you, it was funny because when I hit it, I went, oh, no. But uh, the, the glove went up and the ball stayed down. You know, somebody said that, you know, you should have got a hit. And what difference is it going to make at the end of the season if I've got 40 hits or 20 hits or 21 or 41 you know we won a ball game and it's one ball game we can't lose this year and I'm just excited to be a part of it well Clint Hurdle a very hard worker is glad to be here and the New York Mets are glad to have him now let's go back to the booth to Ralph and Fran and Clint Hurdle said that he signed a weight clause contract the longer he waited to sign the less money he got <laughs> but Clint Hurdle doing quite a job yesterday Sunday in the ball game and uh, that defensive play in the outfield saved the run and it certainly kept the ball game going till the Mets finally prevailed on the RBI by Clint Hurdle. Good crowd on hand. It's just a perfect night for baseball. You know, it's interesting, Ralph. Uh, Harry Windlestead, the home plate umpire and crew chief of uh, the Sump uh, crew, has been talking to Davey Johnson down by the dugout now for about 10 minutes. And I bet they're discussing that balk of Sunday in the ninth inning. Well, we were picked up on that. It's something new in baseball, and I don't think it's a good rule. They say that if a first baseman leaves the first base area, that he cannot leave there and come back. And uh, there's a little more to it, and we'll yeah. try and explain it it's to you in just a moment. Defensively for the Mets, Hernandez at first base, Backman at second, Santana at shortstop, Johnson at third. Foster, Strawberry, and Heap in the outfield, Gary Carter the catcher, and Dwight Gooden the pitcher. Gooden with a record of two and one. He has an earn run average of 1.50. Lifetime against Houston, he's two and one. And he won his first major league game back on April 7th against Houston. And that is what got him started on the 17 and nine year. The rookie of the year, Dwight Gooden. And Dwight Gooden will be pitching against that lineup right there, leading up at second base, Bill Doran. 
Kevin Bass, the right fielder, will bat second. Denny Walling, first baseman in the third slot. Batting cleanup, Jose Cruz, the left fielder. Jerry Mumphrey in center field will bat number five. Batting sixth, the third baseman, Phil Garner. Alan Ashby doing the catching will bat seventh. Batting eighth at shortstop, Craig Reynolds. And Joe Necro batting ninth will be doing the pitching. So Dwight Gooden taking his warm-up tosses. Beautiful night for a ball game, as Ralph mentioned. Good night to pitch a ball game, Ralph. And this copyrighted telecast is presented by authority of the New York Mets and is intended solely for the private, non-commercial use of our audience. Any publication, reproduction, retransmission, or other use of the pictures, descriptions, and accounts of this game without the express written consent of the Mets and Sports Channel is prohibited. Announcers on this telecast are selected by Sports Channel and approved by the Mets. You know, Ralph, as we look at Bill Dorn, you were talking about that block. The rule was really initiated by um, G. Mock. Mock was uh, managing when they used to go to the mound, the pitcher would take a stretch, and if he forgot where the first baseman was, and he was spinning around, instead of holding the ball on the block, he was just throw it to the first baseman, even though he was standing way behind the bag. So. The rule, what, the, what they're saying now is, unless the first baseman is converging on the base. You can't not, throw that. That's right. It's, it's a block. And the umpire that was trying to explain it, Harry Wendelstadt behind home plate. Terry Tate at first base, Jerry Crawford at second, and Gary Davis behind the action at third base. Bill Dorn, the leadoff, batted 261 last year. So far this year, he's hitting 254, no home runs, two RBIs. And Gooden's fastball is fouled back out of play. One more aspect of that rule, as you look at Bill Dorn, is that the first baseman in a bunt situation, moving up from first base, can move up away from the bag. The runner, of course, then moves away from the bag towards second. If you throw to the first baseman in front of the bag, you've got to play at second base, and they're trying to eliminate that. But believe me, don't look in the uh, rules book for that rule. It's no, not in there. No. And it's interesting because I asked the some player in crew, what happens if a guy's on second base and he throws it to the second baseman who's not converging on the base? Said no ball. Well, now Dwight Gooden with a two strikeout. Dwight started this ball game with 26 strikeouts. He is not near the top of the strikeout list. And the fastball foul back. Strikeout leader in the National League is Mario Soto with 36. I've got to wonder if it's in the back of Dwight's mind that I struck out a lot of hitters last year. Everybody's telling me if I throw the ball too much, it'll shorten my career. Gooden last year struck out 276, an all-time record for a rookie in baseball, breaking the record held by Herb Score. He shattered that record. <laughs> Two strikes to count. Curve ball that's popped up. Going back into very shallow left field of Santana and Bill Duran is out. So one away and Kevin Bass the batter. Bass hitting 244 for the year playing right field. He's had two home runs six RBIs. Houston with only six home runs on the year. The Mets have had a total of 13. Kevin Bass, mainly a pinch hitter last year, hit 260 with two home runs. And the fastball strike one. It's interesting. Rarely do you see a guy who is used primarily as a pinch hitter really ever get the opportunity to get in there every day. But Kevin Bass showed that he can do the job. And Bob Lowe's the manager there with the Houston Astros. Dennis Menke sitting next to him on his left. This ball fouled in the stands and the strike two. And Lillo's very high in this guy. Figures he can do it every day. Two strikes to count. Gooden out in front with a two-strike count on his first two batters. Cubs beat San Francisco 3-1 to one today. Throughout the winning pitcher in that game, the save for Smith. Strike three, and he got him with an off-speed pitch. Well, Dwight's been working on that off-speed curveball. It's amazing he can get the real hard curveball over as much as he does. Now he's got an off-speed curveball and just as effective. Strikeout number seven for Dwight Gooden. Now he'll pitch to Denny Walling, who is off to a fine start, hitting 385, no home runs, eight RBIs. Last year he hit 281 with three home runs. He's hit in 10 consecutive ball games, and he has batted 459 with 17 hits over his last 10 games. And the curveball, that one the harder type curve, it's ball one played some third base last year when Ray Knight was injured and Phil Garner was 
I suppose, injured with his bat. The 1-0 delivery. Fastball hit deep to right. Going back is Danny Heap. He is not able to get to it. Is gone. Goodbye. So the second home run hit off Dwight Gooden this year, and Houston takes the lead one to nothing. Well, one of the reasons that guy right there is batting third for a Major League Baseball team is he can swing the bat right there, turning the Dwight Gooden fastball into a home run. You just get the head of the bat on the ball and let the bat do some work. He allowed Dwight Gooden to supply his power. Another look at that swing. Put the head of the bat out there and drove that ball deep to right field. The only other player to hit a home run off of Gooden this year, Jack Clark, who did it opening day. Now the batter will be Jose Cruz. Cruz, one of the most underrated ball players in baseball. He is an amazing hitter. Fastball for ball one. Cruz so far this year. Batting at 333. Last year he hit 312 for the year. And he is number one in hits in the league this year with 26. Ground ball to the shortstop, Santana. And the throw to first base retires the side. So no runs, the home run, the only hit, and no one left on base in the score. At the end of one half inning, Houston won. The Mets coming up. Bottom half of the first inning, the Mets coming to the plate and defensively it's Dennis Walling at first base Bob Dorn will be Bill Dorn will be at second base Craig Reynolds at shortstop Phil Garner at third base Jose Cruz in left field Jerry Mumphrey in center field Kevin Bass in right field Alan Ashby the catcher and Joe Necro the pitcher Joe Necro with a record of one win and two losses an earned run average of two point oh eight lifetime against the Mets he is 13 and 8. He's worked 26 in innings, given up 20, hit struck out 11, and walked 16. Joe Necro. It's a real experience trying to catch a guy like this. It's a, more of an experience to try to hit him, and that's the Mets lineup right there. Wally Backman will try first. Batting second, Howard Johnson, Keith Hernandez in the third slot, Gary Carter, cleanup hitter. Darryl Strawberry, who hit his first grand slam of his career Sunday against the Pirates, will bat fifth. George Foster bat sixth. Danny Heap batting seventh in right field. Rafael Santana, the eighth batter. And batting ninth, a very good hitter, Dwight Gooden. Talking about Joe Necro. Believe me, it's a nightmare for a guy trying to catch a knuckleball. It's like catching three games instead of just one. Joe Necro's knuckleball is not as big as his brother Phil's. Tell the catcher that. It's a little faster, it breaks a little bit sharper, and he throws more sliders and more fastballs than Phil does. Catcher doesn't want to hear it, though. He knows he knows how tough that thing is. And Wally back when the leadoff for the Mets. Wally with a 396 on base percentage, his sixth in the National League. In his last eight ball games, he's batted 462 with 12 base hits. Back when overall hitting 333. Wally off of a five for five day. And there's a good knuckleball. That one really broke out. And all one. Alan Ashby using the big glove. There's a regulation. You can only have a glove so big. Paul Richards started the big glove when he was managing in Baltimore. I believe Hoyt Wilhelm was the pitcher. Gus Triennis the catcher. Didn't help Gus out. He had enough pass balls. Yeah, he, he set all kinds of records. There's two balls and no strikes. <laughs> Actually, the glove was not designed by Paul Richards. It was designed by Harry Bikin who was the pitching coach. But Richards got credit for it, but he did not design it. You're kidding. Paul taking credit again? He does it all the time. <laughs> and now the count at two and one. Back with an idea about Bunny. It's an interesting glove. Now, some catchers will use the regular glove and uh, grab at the ball. Other catchers feel more comfortable with the, knuck uh, with the knuckleball catcher's glove. As you look at Howard Jensen. Topped out to the first base side. Dennis Walling playing first base, and he makes the tag. So one away. Houston leading one nothing and the batter will be Howard Johnson. Howard hitting 163, seven hits and 43 Howard times up. Johnson. I love Joe Torres remark about Paul Richards. They didn't get along at all and someone said why don't you get along with Paul. He says well he always wants you to kiss his ring. <laughs> says, but he wears it in his back pocket. <laughs> <laughs> and 
And now here's the pitch. Knuckleball again. It's ball one. Davey Johnson looking on. Davey, a fine hitter in his own right when he was a major league ball player. That's a pinch hitter. He once had two Grand Slam home runs in one season with the Philadelphia Phillies. Hey, you're talking about Paul Richards. They said when he went out to argue with an umpire, there was no limit on what he would say to an umpire. One ball, one strike. And there's one knuckleball that didn't break too much. I read an article one time where the writer writing the article mentioned Paul Richards as a baseball intellectual. He's gotten that reputation. Yeah. 2-1 pitch. Ground ball hit foul. I think one of the reasons why he got that reputation, he never said much. That's right. That's the secret. Yeah. Very taciturn man. Right here, you're looking at Joe Negro. Joe Negro and his brother Phil with 477 victories coming into this season. Second most ever by brothers in Major League Ball. There's a good knuckleball but fouled by Howard Johnson. See if you can guess who has as brothers more victories than the Necro. Well, the first one that comes to mind, uh, Gaylord Perry and Jim Perry. You got it. Is that right? I figured it was some guy who won 900 games and his brother won two. Well, there, there is a <laughs> trivia question that was true about that. The Perry's won 529, again, a foul ball. But years ago, before the Perry's and Necro's came along, the record was held by two brothers, Christy Matheson and his brother. Is that right? Christy Matheson run something like 300, I've forgotten the exact, exact amount, now 369, and his brother won none. <laughs> <laughs> two and two to count. Johnson hits it right at the first baseman, Walling, who knocks it down, tosses off to Joe Necro, and the out is made. Walling did the right job right there. He got down and smothered the ball. You got time. It's a good idea to get down. Here it is again. You get right down to one knee, smothered the ball. You have plenty of time. Pick it up. Look at the Joe Nico covering first base. So Walling playing a new position, first base. He, Enos Cabal, who usually plays first base, is on the DL. And now it's Keith Hernandez batting. Keith hitting at 303 for the year. No home runs, 12 RBIs. He and Strawberry lead the club and runs battered in with 12. He's batted 311 last year. And he takes that pitch for ball two. Two balls, no strikes. I don't know about you, Fran, but when a knuckleball pitcher was scheduled to pitch, it just took all the joy out of the day. Did it really for you? Huh? They were so tough to hit. And again, it's ball is a ball it's ball three you, you home run hitters like that heater well anything but a knuckleball I don't know anybody like to hit a knuckleball <laughs> right here he might not get a knuckleball see what happens he gets a fastball it's out of the strike zone you know I know what you mean Ralph about that knuckleball as I mentioned a moment ago and I, I'm dead serious I caught a guy named Bruce Del Canton and when I had to catch him your concentration had to be so keen you were exhausted from catching a darn pitch you didn't have to worry about this guy throwing knuckleball. Nolan Ryan. Nolan Ryan, the all-time strikeout leader. Nobody can throw a baseball like Nolan Ryan. He will become the first man to have 4,000 strikeouts in Major League history. I start getting hives when I look at that guy. I'll tell you, I faced him in the minor leagues in Williamsport when he was at the Betts uh, organization. With those bad lights? Oh, and he struck out 19. I was five of them. He struck out 19 in the major leagues. Now the batter is Gary Carter and the knuckleball in the dirt for ball one. Wait a minute, I'm going to take that back. He struck out 21. It was an extra inning ball game, and he struck out 21 batters, and I was five of those batters, and I'm going to tell you, I never learned to hit him in the big leagues either. He's pitched five no-hitters, had one going this year, and lost it in about the seventh inning. One ball, no strikes to Gary Carter. Carter hitting 250. Now it's ball two, two no. Now, when uh, you're trying to catch a knuckleballer, it's very, very difficult. And to catch a knuckleball and throw the ball to second base, it's even more difficult because to throw the ball to second, you have to have rhythm. Catching a knuckleball, you get no rhythm. Yeah, you have to stab at that ball to catch it. You don't know which way you're going to stab. And then once you catch it, now you've got to start trying to get back into your rhythm. And I'll tell you, anybody can steal a base when a knuckleball pitcher's throwing. 
both Phil and Joe Negro have good moves at first. Phil is amazing with his move. This one popped up in the right center field. Coming over is Kevin Bass, and he puts it away, and that ends the inning. Mets get a walk, leave one, and the score at the end of one, Houston won the Mets nothing. Well, a good crowd on hand as the Mets take up with the Houston Astros, a two-game series tonight and tomorrow night. Tomorrow night, it'll be Ron Darling on the mound for the Mets against Bob Nepper, a left-hander. And the fans sitting back right now waiting for something to happen. For the Astros, it happened in the first inning, a home run by Denny Walling to put the Astros on top, 1-0. Now Jerry Mumphrey will be the leadoff batter. Humphrey hitting 250, no home runs, nine RBIs, and he had quite a year for Houston last year. Batted 292 with nine home runs after coming over to Houston from the Yankees. And he's a nice guy and a good ball player. Good defensive center fielder. Very quiet. And the fastball by Dwight Goodness, one ball, one strike. When you talk to him about hitting, his theory is his hand should do all the work. He wants to get the head of the bat out there. He really rarely overswings. And that one right on the inside corner, another fastball. Gooden struck out one in the first. He got Kevin Bass on a curveball. Now with a one-two count. And the fastball foul back out of play. Jerry Mumphrey became disenchanted in New York because of lack of use, and he got back home. He's from Texas. One and two the count. Good and working to Jerry Mumphrey. On deck batter, Phil Garner. Fastball, foul back. Mumphrey with 15 stolen bases, a good base runner. And there's Phil Garner, the veteran. He cleaned up his act a little bit. He has no mustache. Looks like a young kid there. Curveball hit through the middle. The base hit. So Mumphrey singles off the curveball. That puts the leadoff batter on here in the top of the second. And it brings up Phil Garner. One of the, different, oh, one of the things as I mentioned that uh, Mumphrey does so well is he just throws his hands, gets ahead of the bat out on the ball. That rarely overswings, so he's difficult to strike out. I'm looking at a guy right here that's been a good player for years. As Ralph mentioned, without his mustache, probably in his option year, wants to look young. Wants to look young, sign a long-term contract. Garner hit 278 last year in spite of that fine finish. Had four home runs and 45 RBIs. He's a hit and run man, so you got to keep alive with him. And the fastball is strike. I remember when he came up with the Oakland A's, second baseman. He get up the home plate, and I mean, he took a home run hitter's swing every time. He has batted in the cleanup spot in the third spot for Houston. Houston leading one nothing, no one out. We're in the top of the second, a runner at first base. Draws a throw. Chuck Tanner managed him out in Oakland. Chuck Tanner went to the Pittsburgh Pirates and traded for Phil Garner. Chuck Tanner was traded to the Pirates for Manny Sandin. Imagine that. Manager for a catcher. There was an announcer traded for a backup catcher once. That's right, Cliff Dapper. For Ernie Harwell. Ernie Harwell. One strike to count. Fouled it back out of play. You gotta you gotta think twice about your value to a ball club when you trade it for the announcer. That was a ball player traded for a turkey. Come on. They had a big turkey dinner after that. <laughs> that was in the Southern Association. Is that right? Yeah. Here's Alan Ashby. Well, we might as well get something out of him. <laughs> so they kill Good him. meal, that's right. Uh, what was the fellow's name that ran uh, Chattanooga? Engel, I think his name was. He's the fellow that did it. Sounds like a Bill Beck move. Choo Choo Coleman was traded for a bus. <laughs> the bus didn't run. Oh. They wanted their money back. <laughs> There's a two-strike delivery over to first. Gooden has really worked on his move to first base, and it has improved tremendously. It really has. His hands come up a lot quicker Joe than Engel. last year. Joe, Joe Engel of the Chattanooga Lookout. Lookouts. He was some character. That information 
furnished by Tim McCarver from Memphis. That's right. You know how Tim gets into the important facts of this game, you know? He knows what there is to know about the South. <laughs> Two strikes to count. Curveball, strike three, and Gooden gets a second strikeout. Both a bit on curveball. Good pitch from Dwight Gooden. Any hitter in his right mind sits on his fastball. And if he throws you that, you got a problem. So the White gets his first out here in the second inning, and that brings up the catcher, Alan Ashby. Ashby batting 268 for the season. One home run, four RBIs. They got some switch hitters on this ball club. Ashby's another switch hitter. And a good curveball. White's going to his curveball a little bit earlier than normal. Trying to establish that curveball, and then he can go back to the fastball when he gets those hitters aware. <laughs> Excuse me, that he can throw it. One strike to count. Ooh. Next swing, foul ball. Ooh. Carter got it. Hard to get him. Oh, you don't want to talk about it now. Hurts. This ruins your day. And your night. I'm going to tell you right now. One of the problems with catching is you're vulnerable. tips are a way of life yeah. as a catcher. Steve Garland, the Mets head trainer out there to check him out. Evidently he's okay. 1984, Houston was third in the National League of runs scored, but they were 11th in home runs and 11th in stolen bases. Of course, it has something to do with the ballpark. They moved the fences in in Houston. Can't wait to see that. They've only hit eight home runs, though. Nine with a one tonight, and there's a fastball. It's a ball, one and two. You know, we are talking about Dwight Gooden moved to first base. As a power pitcher, they usually kick high, and in order to get that real good fastball, you have to have that great arm extension, which means the arm goes down and comes all the way around up. And to throw to first, you almost have to short arm the ball. You have to get the ball out of the glove and bring it up and across in a hurry, right there. Ron Darling has a great move to first base, and as Ralph mentioned, this kid's really improved in his move. Of course, your feet. You have to have quick feet. Yeah, but the feet will turn that body. That The hand has to really go from the glove up, and while that's happening, you're turning towards first. And a check swing foul ball. Mumphrey all the way down to second base. Here's that foul ball again. This kid, Dwight Gooden, can make you look funny with a bat in your hand. That bat didn't even get off his shoulder. It was almost right there when he got hit. Mumphrey tried to go down to second base and stay there, but he couldn't get away with it. <laughs> <laughs> Little tricks of the trade. I bet in the minor leagues when they had two umpires and one umpire 30, 40 years ago, you saw some funny things happening. When they had one umpire, he umpired behind the pitcher's mouth. And a shattered bat. A try for two. There's one and the other. Keith Hernandez with a 3-6-3 double play, and the head of the bat went farther than the ball. That ends the inning. And the score, as we look at it again. A severe jam shot right here. Boom. As Ralph mentioned, the head of the bat goes farther than the ball. Everybody was nervous down here. And the Mets turn a 3-6-3 double play the hard way. And the score at the end of one and a half innings, it's Houston won the New York Mets nothing. Thank you. Amazing Met action continues tomorrow at 7.15 when the battle rages on with the Astros. Don't miss Nepper and Darling dueling it out. Then at 10.30, Generals 85 recaps this week's matchup against Orlando. What a lineup. Tomorrow only on Sports Channel. Check local listings in New England. Daryl Strawberry to lead off. Daryl brings an eight-game hitting streak into this game, hitting 246 for the year. And he's the club leader in home runs with six. He's not going to let Dale Murphy get too far out in front of him, is he? Murphy with nine leads the 
National League in home runs. And that ball fouled back. Good swing. Strike two. Record for home runs in the month of April. 11. Willie Stargell and Mike Schmidt. Record for RBIs in the month of April. 29. Ron Say. And Murphy has 27. This ball is foul. You know, it's interesting. You watch guys hit foul balls and things. You're not really that impressed. This guy here, when he hits a ball right, the ball just explodes off his bat. Hit that grand slam home run to left center field right into the bleachers. Hit it off of Mike Balecki of the Pittsburgh Pirates. And the knuckleball for ball. After that, the Mets went over 10 innings without a base hit. Still won the ball game five to four. Well, that was an exciting ball game. And the knuckleball. Two and two the count. Joe Necro has won 194 games in his major league career. He's lost 169. And a good knuckleball can't be held onto by the catcher Ashby. He picks it up, makes a tag, and Strawberry's out. Oh, right there. Danced at the last moment. Watch this ball. Just this is the tough one when it goes. No, that that's tough. They're all tough. The knuckleball is real tough. The problem with the knuckleball is you look at it from another angle. They might throw a hundred knuckleballs, and 99 of them will come in and go down. It's the one that comes in and goes up. It usually happens with a guy in third base. Joe Necro and his brother Phil back in 1979, as you look at George Foster, the only brothers to win 20 ball games in the same league the same year. Phil was 21 and 20 that year. Joe Necro was 21 and 11. And Phil and Joe are both pitching tonight. They have met nine times and Joe has won five while Phil has won four pitching against each other and Joe Negro hit a home run off of his brother to beat him one nothing in the ball game the first time they ever met that's got to be dinner conversation oh, for the rest of your life boy. Huh? I'd like to be their parents sitting there while they're pitching against each other well they were sure to have one winner that's right they had to have a pretty good night they both had the 20 wins in one year they sent their parents a plaque and it was inscribed you have filled our lives with love and happiness thank you for being our mother and dad well that was nice huh? very very touching and a strike call two and two very Pla close family yeah plaque like that somebody had to teach them nothing but probably the mother <laughs> two and two knock a ball pop back foul Foster hitting 238 back in action again after being out with the sprained knee. And now three and two. You ready for the foul balls, friend? Oh, yes. Mm. Walked him. Awfully close pitch. Second walk by Joe Necro. Yeah, it was very close pitch. A knuckleball. We'll have everybody fouled up. The umpire will be confused. The catcher has a difficult time catching it. The hitter has a difficult time hitting it. And the umpire has a difficult time staying with the pitch long enough to call it either a ball or a strike. Well, Bob Euchre said the best way to catch a knuckleball is to let it stop rolling and then pick it up. <laughs> Here's Danny Heap hitting 217. No home runs, four RBIs. He's a former Houston ball player. That's got Danny Heat for Mike Scott. Fourth in the National League in wins in 1984 with 16. Third in innings pitched with 248. Ground ball of the shortstop, Craig Reynolds. They'll get two and do. That retires aside. Reynolds to Doran on the first base to Walling. In the inning, no runs, no hits, no errors, no one left on base. The score at the end of two. Houston won, the New York Mets nothing.
Craig Reynolds to lead off for Houston as we go to the top of the third. Houston leading by a score of one nothing. Reynolds hitting 273, two home runs, four RBIs. He has replaced Dickie Thong as the shortstop. Thong, if you recall, last year was hit by Mike Torres in the eye and then did not play again. And Craig Reynolds has been swinging the bat pretty good this year. Dickie Thon having a bit of a problem. And it's punched in the center field as Reynolds goes after Dwight Gooden's first pitch, a breaking ball. Third hit for Houston. Houston, a tough club to strike out. They're little punch and duty type hitters. They get the bat and the ball. Here's Joe Necro. And Joe with a 333 average. He's been up nine times with three hits. You know, it's interesting, Ralph, you mentioned the Punch and Judy Club, and they are a line drive uh, type hitting ball club, and then they decided this uh, past off season to bring in the fences. I think Al Rosen wanted to make a comeback. That's right. Al Rosen, the general manager of the Houston Ball Club, a great baseball player, former MVP, and the bunt attempt is foul. Al Rosen hit 37 home runs his rookie year in the major leagues. He won the Triple Crown. Won the Triple Crown. Outstanding third baseman. Told me in the minor leagues one time he won a triple crown and Bucky Harris, his manager, told him to give up the game. He wasn't going to make it to the big leagues. Bucky's still alive? <laughs> oh, no, he might have been dead right after that statement. <laughs> Rosen was aggressive. He told me when he said that he couldn't believe his ears, you know. Alice with the ball club. there was any, any better competitor than now Rosen. There's a bunt foul on the count of strike two. Great tennis player, great squash player to this day. Like yourself. Always with it. That's right. I saw you. We, I played against you in tennis. Now how about that serve you got? You ever get it in? Never. Never. <laughs> if I could take that net down, I'd be a great tennis player. <laughs> Either that or extend the serving box about <laughs> ten feet. You beat us. We took it like sportsmen. Two strikes to count. Mets still looking for the sacrifice. Houston leading one nothing. And Equal Squares bunts it out in front of the plate. Fielded by Gooden, thrown in the center field. So Dwight Gooden, in his haste, throws it away. And now Houston with runners at first and second. Here it is again. We'll take a look. Dwight Gooden charging the ball. Watch him throw this ball to second base. Obviously, his release point was very high. And the ball shoots in the center field. And the Astros now have runners on first and second. Nobody out here in the top of the third. And the White's being charged an error on that play. And now the batter will be Bill Doran. And the Mets are looking for a possible sacrifice here. Doran popped a short his first time up. defensively has not made an error this year. Even in spring training in the notes. They have the, they're counting spring training now. <laughs> and the fastball high throw to second. They'll get him. He has got to be out. Craig Reynolds trapped off second base on the strong throw by Gary Carter. Here it is again. Quick feet, quick release right on the money. Gary Carter since Sunday with his bat is 0 for 7. Defensively, he's playing 1,000. Big play right here. Outstanding throw. Evidently, Santana got hurt as he made the tag. Might be dirt in his eye. We'll take another look at this throw. There's a tag right here. Santana taking a perfect throw. Putting the tag on the, on the runner at second base. Got a kick in the face. Steve Garland again out there to check him out. So Greg and Reynolds. Kick Rafael Santana. In the head. So a big pickoff play for the New York Mets. You know, it's interesting. The Astros play an artificial surface in Houston, so most of them, I'm sure, would use the rubber cleat. I wonder if they use the rubber cleat on the road as opposed to the spike. They probably don't. They probably wear the spike. 
I know Rusty Staub, when he played in Houston, used one of each. Then he'd get on base and he'd change. <laughs> oh, boy. I mean, that's getting technical, isn't it? <laughs> he was technical the other day. Did you see him pursue that ball with a great oh. deal of vigor? What a play. He streaked after it. <laughs> Ground ball to Hernandez. They'll get the force play at second. Now the try for the double play, and they can't pull it off. Going a little too fast for that high bouncing ball to be turned into a double play. Nice play right there by Hernandez. Back to him. And oh, Dorn slow. safe. Here it is again. Another angle. Left-handed first baseman. Classy looking. He was safe. Mets turn the 3-6-3 double play to end the second inning. Now the batter with a runner at first base and two men out will be Kevin Bass. Bass was struck out on a curveball his first time up. Houston leading one nothing two men out top of the third inning. Warren had 21 stolen bases last season. So far this year he's had three out of five. Houston not able to run too successfully. They've only been successful eight out of 17. Good move to first little high throw though. And usually Ralph when they uh, build a club around guys that hit line drives they usually build it with speed in mind. And it's strike one. If, if a club like the Red Sox in Fenway Park is built it's usually built with power. Very few stolen bases. A club like the Houston Astros, you expect a lot of stolen bases. Kevin Bass originally signed with Milwaukee. He was in the Don Sutton trade. Runner goes, the pitch out, the throw is perfect. They got him. Not a contest. So Carter picks one off and throws one out. Once again, Gary Carter calling for a pitch out, throwing a bullet to second base to nip Bill Doran, who runs well. And as Ralph mentioned, no contest. Another angle. So in the inning, no runs, one hit, two spectacular plays by Gary Carter. No one left on base. The score at the end of two and a half innings. Houston won, the New York Mets nothing. Well, Mother's Day is coming up this year on Sunday, May 12th, and the Mets plan on making it very special for Mom that day. The Mets and Phillies meet at 135 on Mother's Day, and all ladies 16 and over who come to the game will receive a beautiful cosmetic bag, bag courtesy of the Mets and Jeremac. As an added bonus that day, a pair of Jeremac products, a shampoo and conditioner, will be included in the bag, so don't make Mom stay home and cook on her day. Bring her to Shea on Sunday, May 12th. The Mets and Phillies at 135. Well, the Mets' newest fan club is now open for membership and for the first time is open to fans of all ages. Members of the Mets Super Fan Club will receive a fantastic value for only $4. Our Super Fan kit consisting of full-size Catch the Rising Stars pennant, a bumper sticker, button, and the 1985 Special Edition 8-Player Baseball Card Panel. To become an official Mets Super Fan, send a check or money order for $4, along with your name and address to Mets Super Fan Club, Shea Stadium, Flushing, New York, 11368. That's Mets Super Fan Club, Shea Stadium, Flushing, New York, 11368. And Rafael Santana. To lead off for the Mets, he's batting 192, one home run, five RBIs. Houston leading 1-0. Santana will be followed by Dwight Gooden in the batting order. Mets have not had a base hit. They've had two base one runners on walks off of Joe Necro. And a dancing knuckleball. They say watching a knuckleballer pitch is like watching A.J. Foyt, Parker Carr. <laughs> One strike pitch, another knuckleball, one ball, one strike. What makes it real difficult, if a guy has a good knuckleball and can throw it for strikes, you have to sit on it all the time. And if he throws you a slider or a fastball when it's not called for, less than a 3-0, 3-1 count, forget it. You're going to take the funky swing at that pitch. You might as well just take it. And a 
to knock a ball foul. One ball two strikes. Yes. Joe Necro has never pitched a no hit no run game. He was pitching for Detroit against the Yankees and won eight in the third innings when Horace Clark got a base hit to break up his no hitter. His brother Phil has. Two and two. The old knuckleball. It's amazing. First knuckleball I ever faced was Hoyt Wilhelm. You started out at the top. I certainly did. Going mm -hmm. in the Hall of Fame this year. Yep. Foul back. I was with the San Francisco Giants, and uh, we were playing the Los Angeles Dodgers. So Hoyt Wilhelm is pitching. I'm called in to pinch hit. And Charlie Fox, the manager, tells me, look, and crowd the plate, because when you crowd the plate, this guy can't throw strikes. And it's a drive to center field. Coming up on the ball is Mumphrey, and he puts it away. That's the best contact the Mets have made. So you crowded the plate? I crowded the plate. You know, uh, you got to be relatively rational when you're doing this. He just made a statement to me. This guy can't throw strikes. He's pitched about 40 years at the big leagues with that knuckleball. I'm sure somebody besides <laughs> me crowded the plate. He threw me three of the nastiest knuckleballs I've ever seen. I swung at the last one. I missed it. Tom Haller was catching, not a general manager with the, with the San Francisco Giants, and hit him on the kneecap. And the knuckleball to Gooden. Ball one. So the theory of crowding the plate went right down the tubes after that. You can get all kinds of theories. There are two very important theories on how to hit a knuckleball, and unfortunately, neither work. <laughs> what are the theories? Well, one is crowding the plate. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, what, a, what an experience that was. And the other is to get up in front of the plate. 1-1 one, one pitch, knuckleball, Santana went after it, one and two. Should say good and went after. Look at that knuckleball. Handcuffed the catcher, Alan Ashby. I know Dwight Gooden didn't see a knuckleball like this down there in high school in Tampa. Alan Ashby, he's exhausted right now. Emotionally, he's exhausted. And now the cat goes to three and two. That was one of Bob Euchre's lines. They said that when Euchre was trying to catch Phil Necro, that Nico could pitch every day, but he couldn't catch <laughs> every day. So that's why Nico didn't pitch every day. You get exhausted chasing that thing. Oh, really? So the Mets get their third walk as Gooden picks up one. Hey, if you weren't afraid of getting Dwight Gooden hurt sliding into second base, I'd send him. It is so tough to catch that knuckleball and throw a guy out. And for the Mets, it's Wally Backlund in the batter's box. Wally grounded out to the first baseman his first time up. And Wally, Wally Backman's the type of guy to he'll put that bat out, fake a bunt, bring the bat right back in the catcher's face. That'll make it even more difficult to catch it and throw it. And I, can, I can't see Tim McCarver, and I'm not going to look at him, but I know right now he's going through emotional stress. And the pitcher puts on a jacket like that on the base pad. <laughs> he yells over, you got it. <laughs> I'll tell you right now, if he was managing Dwight Gooden, though, he'd say, Dwight, you could do anything you want with that jacket. He gets paranoid over Yeah, there. no, he doesn't like it. Well, he's from Memphis. Yeah, I guess It's warm it. down there. Well, it's warm here tonight. There's no question about that. First pitch to Backman of all. Lifetime against the Mets. A winning record of 13 and 8. And Backman wants it. It's not far enough out. Balling comes over to make the play, and he makes the tag. And on the play, Gooden goes down to second. So the Mets have the time run at second with two men out and Howard Johnson coming up. Well, hustling Wally Backman right here, trying to avoid the tag of Denny Wally. And the fans here at Shea appreciate that type of effort as Wally Backman was heading towards the Met dugout to give him a nice ovation. Now, he should not get a sacrifice on that as he was bunting for a base hit, but some scorers will give him a sacrifice. What if you bunted that ball? What would you? Well, you didn't bunt. What if you bunted it, though? What would you want as you were I running to first? Sacrifice. That's right. <laughs> no doubt about <laughs> it. <laughs> Take all you can get. Did you ever bunt? Sure. Did you? Did you do it reluctantly? No, I bunted for base hits occasionally. Ninth inning, you needed to get it on base or something yeah. like that. Third baseman standing out in left field. <laughs> <laughs> now the batter, Howard Johnson, and he pops it up back of home plate. Ashby coming back. He has room, and he makes the catch, and that retires the side. 
So in the inning, a walk and a man left at second. And the score at the end of three, Houston won the New York Mets nothing. Well, one nothing ball game through three. You're watching all the action on Sports Channel. Graphic right there, 1984 Houston's 264 team batting average. The second highest in franchise history. Houston Astros. And leading off for the Astros, Kevin Bass. He struck out his first time up and slided into the booth, Tim McCarver. Three hits for the Astros. The Mets have yet to get a hit off Joe Necro. And Kevin Bass takes a fastball on the black. Quite good and gave up a home run in the first inning to Danny Walling. Tough team for Dwight Gooden. They do not have a lot of free swingers on this team. And there's a ground ball. Score at 63. Type of team like the St. Louis Cardinals or the Houston Astros, certainly a tougher club for a power pitcher like Dwight Gooden because they've got a lot of contact hitters. This guy right here made contact his first time up with his with the second home run of the year hit off Dwight Gooden. And last year, Fran, it wasn't until June 22nd when Andre Dawson hit a home run against Gooden that the second home run was hit off Dwight. Andre Dawson hitting some home runs this year as Dennis Walling drives another ball deep to right field. Danny Heap going back makes the play. That ball was tattooed. Nice play by Danny Heap in right field. Two outs. That first one that Walling hit was up around the way, about waist high. This ball's down and in. Just drop the bat head. Boom. That ball down and in, especially to a left-handed hitter, is one of the most dangerous pitches, in my opinion, the most dangerous pitches of any location, left-hander or right-hander. And the batter now, a good hitter, Jose Cruz. Two outs. And Cruz swings through a fastball, strike one. You know, Tim, you mentioned an interesting point. The Astros will give Dwight quite a problem because they put the bat in the ball. They'd be better off hitting against Joe Necro than the Mets would. Yeah, that's probably true. Of course, it's not going to work like that tonight. No. I don't believe in that. That dog will hunt. <laughs> <laughs> no balls and two strikes at Jose Cruz. Cruz is hitting 10 of his last 11 ball games. He had 12 home runs last year. All of them came on the road. Yeah, Jerry be... Mumphrey, nine home runs. All of them came on the road. Are you surprised after play that he has to? Not though? really. No. The 0-2 pitch. Swing and a miss, strike three. So Dwight Gooden gets one of the best hitters in the game right here. This is the best place for Dwight Gooden's fastball. Ball up and in right around the letters. Got to make him get the ball down. But you see how Cruz swung under that ball, and Dwight gets the Astros for the first time tonight. Three up, three down. So here in the fourth, three up, three down, and after three and a half on the Sports Channel scoreboard, one zip, Astros. Well, Keith Hernandez will lead it off for the Mets here. Bottom of the fourth, one nothing. Astros on top of the Mets. And there's the knuckler for a strike. Joe Necro pitching to Hernandez. Alan Ashby attempting to catch the knuckle. One and one. The biggest difference between Joe Necro and his brother Phil is that Joe Necro's ancillary stuff is a lot better. Good slider, good fastball. But definitely his knuckleball is his best pitch. Two and one as he just missed with the knuckle. Talking about trying to hit a guy with that fastball and slider and a good knuckler. You're going you're gonna to see some funky swings because of that knuckler. Fouled off two and two. There was a time when Joe Necro did not have the knuckleball when he pitched for the Chicago Cubs back in 1968, a time when he really threw hard. Now you saw Joe Necro grip that knuckleball with his front two fingers. Actually, a knuckleball is a misnomer. And it's popped up right there. Shallow left field. Reynolds back and makes a play. One down. You're right, Mr. McCarver. Explain that knuckleball. I will, right after this promo, pal. Okay. Baseball's busting loose, and Sports Channel's got it covered. Join our friend Healy Thursday at 10.30 for inside scoops and interviews on Pennant Chase exclusively on Sports Channel. Check your local listings in New England. And Gary Carter will be the batter. One out, bottom of the fourth. One nothing, Astros on top of the Mets. Mm. 
Good one. <laughs> it's a good one. Getting to the knuckleball. Actually, it's a fingertip ball. It's thrown with the fingertips and not with the knuckles. <laughs> Even though I'm sure the knuckles come into play. <laughs> <laughs> They're connected to that. They come into play as far as is gripping a ball. I, I've talked with Joe about it several times. It's almost a pushing effect. Uh, with that knuckleball and the seam is very important on the baseball when it's thrown. Rarely will you see a knuckleball pitcher grip the ball with those two fingertips off seam, a no seamer. The seam's very, very important. There you see Nuxy. And they say the wind is very important. Uh -huh. Although it's never really been proven, I'm sure. <laughs> well, friction maybe. I don't know. Same with some curveballs. Some curveballs, as Harry Wendelstead just gets one right in the throat. That is not any fun, no. believe me. No, it isn't. But in Candlestick Park, a lot of times the pitcher's curveball may uh, be better because of that win. And I'm sure the same thing applies with the curveball. Boy, that had to hurt. But it probably got muscle. Back in 1979, I took my first and only shot in the Adam's apple. Curveball from Steve Carlton trying to pitch around Paul Blair. Sit a lot in the, in the muscle of the neck. Wow. Strike three as Gary Carter goes after the knuckleball. Two outs. Well, this is a dancer right here. I mean, that ball is really going down and out. Strawberry. And Ashby does his usual fine job behind the plate catching that ball. Yeah, you really have to applaud the efforts of anybody that can get behind the plate and uh, catch that knuckleball. The best I've ever seen was a guy named Ed Herman. Caught Wilbur Wood very in, a, in an excellent fashion. Well, that was a funky knuckleball right there. The thing you have to do, you have to relax your arms. If your arms are extended on the knuckleball, then the knuckleball, by dancing around, it hits friction. It's like bouncing off a wall. So what Alan Ashby is trying to do is relax his arms as much as possible, and you catch it like you hit it. And Darrell Strawberry pops the ball up, left field. Cruz under it, makes the play for out number three. So for the Mets here in the fourth, three up, three down, and at the end of four, one nothing. Astros on top of the Mets. Well, big crowd on hand here at Shea Stadium as the Mets and the Astros go at it. It's top of the fifth inning. Astros won. Mets nothing for the Astros. It'll be Jerry Mumphrey, Phil Garner, and then Alan Ashby. Fran, I got an interesting letter the other day from uh, the head baseball coach of Jefferson High School down in Tampa. Pop Cuesta is his name. C-U-E-S-T-A. And he was talking about what a difficult time high school hitters had in facing Dwight Gooden, who, of course, uh, went to Hillsborough High, an opponent of Jefferson High down in Tampa. And he said that on the same pitching staff with Dwight Gooden were three number one draft choices. Wow. Floyd Yeoman, who signed with the Mets and now with the Expos, went to the Expos in the Gary Carter train. Vance Lovelace, who threw the 95-mile-an-hour fastball as Gary Carter is out of there now and hurdles behind the plate. Hmm. Yeah, it looked like Gary limped away from home plate after uh -huh. he swung at the knuckleball. Of course, he had some bruised ribs yes. from the game the other day. But anyway, the fourth pitcher on that staff was Albert Everett, who was a 20th round choice of the Twins. How would you like to Boy. face that as a high school? How'd that be opponent? some kid in high school and you played them once or twice and it's your first game, you go out there and you, and you have to face these guys <laughs> say, I'm going to get out of this sport. It's not fair. Well, Clint Hurdle is in the ball game, as Tim just mentioned. We're in the top of the fifth inning. One nothing. Astros on top of the Mets. Three hits for the Astros. And the Mets have yet to get a hit off of Joe Necro. And the batter for the Astros will be Jerry Mumphrey. No balls. One strike on the switch hitting center fielder. Astros have five switch hitters in the lineup tonight as Mumphrey swings through a fastball. No balls and two strikes. There was another young man down there named Richard Monteleone who threw at 90 plus and was also a number one draft choice and was going to go to Hillsborough High but went to a private school instead. Probably wouldn't have made the team. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
off the plate, one ball and two strikes. I guess it's safe to say that talent is abundant in the Tampa yeah. area, huh? Yeah, it really is. And of course, young kids will be even motivated more to take baseball seriously after seeing all these guys get drafted number one. Swung on and missed. Strike three. One out. Well, again, the high fastball. Cannot get on top of that high fastball. You saw Cruz make the last out in the fourth inning, swinging under the fastball. And the same thing with Jerry Mumphrey. Our K corner guy's been a little quiet tonight. Yes, Only the yes. fourth strikeout for <laughs> Dwight Gooden. And the batter, Phil Garner. Well, there's a good hook right there, strike one. A yellow hammer. Oh, boy. Yacker. Garner's saying, don't do it again. Throw me it. Let me try to hit that fastball. Down low with the heater. One ball and one strike. Garner has a career 40 RBIs against the Mets. Scrap iron. <laughs> number, speaking of number one draft choices, he was one of the Oakland A's back in 71 out of the University of Tennessee. Ooh. Yeah, that's a mismatch right there. This guy's a good major league hitter. And that's a key point. 12 Astros in the 4-2 game last year. You know, this guy is not facing high school hitters no. anymore. Oh, no, no, he's facing good major league hitters, and sometimes he can embarrass them. There's that high fastball. Strike three. Two outs. And this is some kind of bat, and at bat you go back and say, what the heck? I was just overmatched. Two nasty curveballs and that high rider. He'll say more than what the heck after that. He'll be... Well, I mean, really, I think that's one at bat that you do say that's what right. the heck at. I mean, after all, you got to give that guy credit. Oh, right without there. a doubt. Yeah. The Astros, as you saw the graphic on the screen before, they've been through it before with this guy, Dwight Gooden, in strikeouts. And the batter, Alan Ashby. It's a ground ball, first base, score at three to one, and that'll do it for the Astros here in the top of the fifth. After four and a half on the Sports Channel scoreboard, Astros one, Mets nothing. Saturday at two, the Yanks go up against Royal Power. Don't miss the action, the Yankees and Royals, Saturday at two, only on Sports Channel. George Foster will lead it off for the Mets. Through four and a half innings of play, one nothing. Astros on top of the Mets. George Foster played ten and a half seasons with the Cincinnati Reds. Joined the New York Mets, and this year has the opportunity to play with another pennant winner. Fouls the knuckleball off strike one. By the way, a note: Gary Carter left the ball game, as Tim mentioned before. He left the game experiencing discomfort in the rib, injured in Sunday's collision with Doug Froebel. You have to hope that Gary Carter will not be out too long, but that's one of the problems you have with catchers. You never know. It's a difficult position. Nice catch right there. That's a tough knuckleball. One ball and one strike. Three hits in this game. The Astros have all three. Swung on and missed. Strike two, one and two. Tim, you know, you talked about uh, the knuckleball and, and the gripping of the knuckleball as you look at Eddie Lynch loosening up on the Met bullpen, just getting some throwing in. And he's the scheduled starter on Friday. It's interesting. If a guy, uh, if you have a guy that really can pick up pitches because there's so much of that arm in the glove, they can tell when he's going to go away from knuckleball. Foul ball. Open glove, knuckleball, closed glove, something else. Yeah, there are a lot of guys who can read that. Because the knuckleball, when you get your fingers down deep into the glove, then uh, a lot of guys can, uh, can figure out, because the glove is open, that he's going to throw a knuckleball. And with the closed glove, because you're gripping the ball with your fingers around the ball, you don't, uh, you're not going to be throwing a knuckleball. But obviously, knuckleball pitchers are aware of that. Phil Necro was actually uh, a guy you could pick up his pitches, but if you picked up a knuckleball, you want to call the timeout. <laughs> <laughs> so what? So you pick it up. <laughs> Big deal. We used to face Wilbur. Everybody said, we got his pitches. Strike three to George Foster. That was a nasty knuckleball right there. One out. Watch Alan Ashby. He just waits. He lets the ball come to him. 
that big cushion, that sofa pillow that he's using back there. We talked uh, last inning about how you catch a knuckleball the same way that you hit it. We'll, we'll explain a after this pitch. And Danny heaps the batter. He takes down low ball one. Duke Snyder said that unusually that he learned how to hit a knuckleball by catching Gil Hodges' knuckleball on the side. Gil Hodges used to experiment with his knuckleball on the side, and, and uh, Duke told me he had a good one. And from what I understand, Duke Snyder could flat hit a knuckleball. Is that right? And I know catching it is the same way. You have to let the ball develop. And you have it's no easy task to catch it or to hit it. But you have to wait. You have to wait as long as you dare. If you stride too early, you're dead. One and one on heat. There's a knuckleball. Two balls and one strike. And I, I mentioned earlier how difficult it is when a guy's on base to catch it and throw it. And one thing you got to keep in mind, not only is your rhythm all fouled up, but the glove's so big, it'd be tough to get the ball out of the glove. There's a shot at the middle. Base hit. So Danny Heath gets the first hit of the ball game for the Mets. Now you saw Alan Ashby catch the knuckleball. This is how you hit the knuckleball. You wait right back through the originator. Good piece of hitting by Danny Heath. You know, that, by the way, Fran, is not an ironclad uh, just by waiting. That doesn't mean you're going to hit it, <laughs> no. but that's your proper approach. The longer you wait, the better off you are, whether you're catching it or hitting it. And here's a guy that slapped the line drive in the center field with authority, but it was caught by Jerry Mumphrey, Rafael Santana. So he's over one, runner on first. I'd send anybody with that knuckleball. Outside, ball one. If you're sure he's going to throw it. When Necro's behind in the count, he's probably more prone to throw that uh, slider or fastball to a guy like Santana who doesn't have a lot of long ball threat. But if you're ahead in the count one and two, I totally agree with you. Okay. Take off. Let's see what he throws right here. There he goes. Knuckleball throw to second. Nice throw. Excellent throw by Alan Ashby. He caught a good knuckleball and threw the runner out. Excellent play. Tough thing about throwing the ball is not necessarily once you catch it, if you do catch it. But when you go in that big mid, a lot of times all you come up with is leather. And Alan Ashby came up with the ball and made a strike throw to second base to get Danny Heath. And there are two men down. Santana with two balls and one strike. And you know, we were talking about Tony Pena Sunday. You mentioned how it's his rhythm getting getting in position to throw the ball. And when you catch a knuckleball, it's tough to have rhythm. Uh-huh. Yeah, because you're concerned with catching the ball as opposed to throwing it. Because you have to wait. And when you have to wait back, you can't go out and get in a proper position to make a strong throw. Yeah, I'll tell you, I, I, I know he just threw Danny Heath, but I would send everybody. He'd have to throw everybody out with that duckling. Swung and missed, strike three. Good knuckleball right there. Santana goes down swinging. And for the Mets, they picked up a hit in this inning. Danny Heath, he was cut down trying to steal a base in on the Sports Channel scoreboard at the end of five. one nothing Astros. Well, the National League scoreboard, the Chicago Cubs over the San Francisco Giants, 3-1. to one. Philadelphia thumping those Expos at the vet in Philadelphia, 6 to nothing. Pittsburgh over the San Diego Padres, 3-2. to two. That game in the bottom of the fifth now. And Los Angeles at St. Louis, no score. Bottom of the first inning, the Cardinals batting. And Atlanta at Cincinnati in the fifth with no score. Boy, that Cincinnati club is really getting some good pitching. And the Houston Astros are sending Craig Reynolds to the plate, then Joe Necro and Bill Dorn as we go to the top of the sixth inning. one nothing Astros on top of the Mets. Jay Tibbs, a teammate of Dwight Gooden, has started that game. Atlanta has now come up with three runs in the top of the fifth, so it's 3 nothing Atlanta, bottom of the fifth inning for in Cincinnati. Interesting graphic right there. 60 RBIs for Craig Reynolds in 1984. He's done a fine job for the Astros. He's one of very few have been... Named to the All-Star team in both leagues. This guy has been named to the All-Star team in the American League as a member of the Seattle Mariners and uh -huh. then with the Astros in the National League. One ball, no strikes on Reynolds. Wow. That was a pretty good fastball right there. Did that hit Clint Turtle's knee? <laughs> That's tough. Well, well, you don't catch every day. You have to go in and catch good. I'd rather go in and catch Gooden than oh, yeah. Joe Necro. Oh, yeah, without a doubt. 
Three balls and no strikes on Greg Reynolds. Reynolds singled his first time up. Mentioned in the All-Star game and both legs as Dwight Gooden was the pitcher in the All-Star game last year. Phil Garner also played in the American League All-Star game and the National League All-Star game. Three balls and one strike on Reynolds. Dwight, Dwight Gooden's going to play, excuse me, Fran, Dwight Gooden's going to play in a few more All-Star yes, games, is. too, before his career is over. He's got some great stuff. And Hurdle calls for that fastball. Reynolds knows it, gets it, fouls it back. Three and two. As I mentioned, big crowd here. Tuesday night ball game. the Astros and the Mets are watching all the action on Sports Channel. I'm Fran Healy, along with Tim McCarver and Ralph Kiner, as you look at the crowd. And tomorrow night, Another game, the Astros and the Mets. So if you can't make it out here to Shea Stadium tomorrow night, catch all the action right here on Sports Channel. Full count. It stays full. Mets are averaging 30,000 plus for their home attendance, and that's about how many they have here tonight, I'd say, 20, 27 to 30. It's an interesting crowd on a Tuesday evening in May. School still in. Gooden can pack him in. Yes, he can. And the ball's popped up. Shallow left field. Rafael Santana goes back, makes the catch for out number one. So as I mentioned, top of the six, one nothing. Astros on top of the mess. No for the Astros. White Gooden Take against Joe Necro, Joe. and the batter Good now play. will be Mr. Necro. Joe Necro for one in his ball game. Last time up, Joe tried to bunt and a wild throw by Dwight Gooden trying to get Craig Reynolds at second base, the only error of the ball game. And Necro hits a ground ball. Santana plays it on the high hop and scores it six to three. You know, looking at Joe Necro, Tim, you have to wonder how many, what's the chances of two guys from the same family playing in the major leagues? And then you think of the Alou brothers. At three. Yeah, it's amazing. Jesus, Matty, and Felipe. They're, the Alou brothers were like the Sutter brothers in hockey, well, right? They they five of them, five or they? six, yeah. Yeah, amazing. Sometimes I get dinner with those guys, and all of a sudden somebody gets excited and mad, and they start throwing punches. <laughs> Here's family dinner, bang. <laughs> That's a good way to... <laughs> keep you from picking up the tab, <laughs> getting a fight. <laughs> it's one of our director Bill Webb's ploys. <laughs> every time uh, every time dessert is ordered, Bill Webb wants to fight somebody. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bill Dorr is the batter. One ball, no strike count. He's 0 for 2 in his game, and Dorn fouls the ball back. One ball, one strike. I mentioned five switch hitters in his game for the Astros. Dorn is one. Not only does Bill Webb not pick up the tab, he wants your receipt. <laughs> <laughs> he wants to double pop you. <laughs> oh, boy. Here we go. One ball and two strikes. Bill Dorn facing Dwight Gooden on a beautiful evening in New York. Pitch right there giving Clint a bit of a problem. That ball looks like Clint's catching with a pop gun back there. <laughs> I'll tell you that uh, coming in in that situation, catching Dwight Gooden, we're kidding about that. Boy, that could be a tough assignment. That ball gets up there in a hurry. Clint Hurdle has only been a catcher for two years. This is his third year, and he had to learn how to catch in those bad lights in the minor yeah. leagues. It's not an easy position to learn. After you've been in the big leagues about six years. Oh, oh there's an excellent big league curveball from Dwight Gooden. It strikes out Bill Doran. Six strikeouts through six innings, and this is a legitimate curveball right there, folks. And Man. after five and a half, as you look at the K corner on the Sports Channel scoreboard, Astros won, Mets nothing. <laughs> 
Well, Billy Martin's back, and so are the Yankees right here on Sports Channel. You can catch all the action when the Bronx Bombers battle George Brett and the Royals. Don't miss a minute of baseball at its best. Saturday, it's 2 o'clock right here on Sports Channel. And right here on Sports Channel, we have the Mets and the Astros. Bottom of the sixth inning, 1-0. Astros on top of the Mets. The line score through 5.5. Astros, one, one run, three hits, no errors. Mets, no runs, only one hit and one error. And Dwight Gooden will lead it off for the Mets here in the bottom of the sixth. He'll be followed by the top of the order, Wally Backman, and then Howard Jensen. So Dwight Gooden walked his first time up, and he'll face the knuckleball. There's Dr. John McMullen in the center, owner of the Houston Astros from the Garden State, New Jersey, as Dwight Gooden pops the ball up. Alan Ashby is under it and makes the play with the big miss. One down. In that particular instance right there, you're happy you have a big look. That's right, because you don't have to throw it. In the American League, the New York Yankees, scoreless with Texas batting in the bottom of the first. Detroit over Minnesota. Boy, have those twins been hot. Two to one in the fourth. Two to one Baltimore over Chicago in the fourth. No score. Cleveland at Kansas City and Boston at California later. As is Milwaukee at Seattle and Toronto at Oakland. And now the batter, Wally Backman. He's 0 for 2 in the game. Now check that. He got a sacrifice on an attempted bunt for a base hit. So he's 1 0 for 1. By the way, pitching for the Yankees tonight is Joe Necro's brother, Phil. This is the third time this year they pitched on the same night. I'll tell you, Joe Necro, the baby brother of Phil. Phil, 40, what, six years old? Right. And Joe, 40 years old. What are the chances of that happening? Two brothers in the major leagues at that age. Two balls and one strike on Wally Backman. Gaylord Perry pitched till he was 43 years old. Gaylord had a trick pitch, too. Oh, yeah. That moved a lot. <laughs> yes. A lot of grease. <laughs> Filed back, two and two. Gaylord was smart. He never told anybody where he got it. I mean, he was a fixture with the San Francisco Giants, but he ended up getting traded. Bob Lillis, manager of the Astros. They're telling Phil Garner to play Wally Backman shallow, even though there's two strikes on him. Kind of interesting one. Yeah. Outside with a knuckle, three balls and two strikes. Thing is, Backman can hit the ball that way. I'd back up. He's not going to bunt right now. I'd back up in a regulation depth. So full count on Wally Backman. And he pulls the ball second base, and Bill Doran gets a nice hop. Score it four to three. And stepping up. <laughs> well, the batter now, Howard Johnson, he's 0 for 2 in this ball game. Kind of a clean game. Chris. Chris. Uh -huh. Yeah. It is. The other day, the Mets and the Pirates tangled for 18 exciting innings. Well, there was some baseball the other day. And now we have a pitcher's duel. Two outs here in the sixth, and Howard Johnson takes a ball. Well, you're watching all the action on Sports Channel live from Shea Stadium, Flushing, New York. There's the line score. one nothing. Astros on top of the Mets. Johnson takes down low, ball two. I'm Fran Healy, along with Tim McCarver and Mr. Ralph Kiner. There comes a time in a ball game where you try to jerk one, and this is one time. Howard Johnson will get something other than a knuckleball. And he tries to jerk it. He pops the ball in the right field, and Kevin Bass gets over there and makes the play for out number three. So for the Mets here in the six, three up, three down, and after six on the Sports Channel scoreboard, Astros one, Mets nothing. Top of the seventh inning, a one nothing ball game. The only scoring in this game, a first inning home run with two out nobody on by Denny Walling of the Houston Astros as they lead the Mets, and we welcome Ralph Kiner back in the booth. Ralph? Okay, Tim. And whatever you said about Bill Webb goes double for me. <laughs> that's because he that's because he asked you for a receipt too. <laughs> Absolutely. Right? Two receipts and still doesn't pick up the tab. <laughs> Here's Kevin Bass, who's 0 for 2. He has struck out and grounded to short. 
one nothing game top of the seven line drive base hit so Kevin Bass comes through with the fourth base hit off Dwight Gooden and the batter is the fellow responsible for the only scoring in this game so far Denny Walling he's hit the ball hard twice the home run in the first inning and then he drilled one to right in the uh, third inning he now has hit in 11 consecutive ball games that is the high in the 1985 season for the National League the high in the major leagues is held by Pat Tabler of the Cleveland Indians he's batted safely or he had batted safely in 15 straight games until taking an 0 for 4 yesterday that's a threat to run and good knows it really out of the shoot ranking second behind Dale Murphy of the Atlanta Braves as far as batting average is concerned and the Houston dugout wants a balk call on that last move to first base Harry Wendelstedt saying no sir the drive really has picked up his move to first base from last year where he picked off one batter all season long now he's holding the runners very close Swing and a miss. Walling going for another one. Speaking of going for other ones, how about Larry Parrish? Three home runs in last night's ball game to become only the fifth guy in Major League history to have three home runs in both leagues. And do you know that Bill Mazur called this in? Harry Wendelstedt, by the way, talking to Walker, the pitching coach of the Houston Astros. But do you realize Bill Mazur called in this to Jay Horowitz, our uh, publicity director and that every other guy to hit three home runs in both leagues had at one time a New York affiliation played with the New York baseball team. Oh and two Johnny Mize. He Dave was the King first to do it. Dave Kingman and uh, Claude L. Washington. Babe Ruth and Babe Claude Ruth. L. Washington yeah. all played with New York teams. So Larry Parrish is the only guy to do it without a New York affiliation. Kind of interesting. It's 0 and two to Denny Wallen. Got him at first base. Picked off was Kevin Bass. And I'll guarantee you the Astros are going to complain about that. They've been complaining the whole ball game about that move. All right here, the fast move over to first base. Bass caught moving the other way and the tag by Hernandez. And that is the second batter picked off, batter runner picked off at first base by Dwight Gooden this year. I guess Dwight said that fast Bass won't last right That's there's right Todd Lillis and he didn't last her ball is low one and two to Denny Walling Dwight has not been called for a balk that's an old Dodger move that is close to a balk move you remember Drysdale using that all the time certainly did and the Dodgers were very good at this of course any good move to first is close to a balk ball hit well the center field Daryl Strawberry loping back middle of the warning track makes the catch boy that Walling has hit three shots tonight one over the fence and two rockets his second and third time up two out you get in those grooves where everything looks good to you and you guess right all the time and that's why you get in those good hitting situations and when you get in the slump it's the other way around can't wait to get to the ballpark when you're hitting well. The ball looks like a cantaloupe, doesn't it? When it's the other way around, it looks like an aspirin. It's, a, it's just one or the other. There's hardly any in between. Here's Jose Cruz. Takes a strike on the inside. Jose batted 400 against the Mets last year with a home run and five RBIs. One of the most consistent hitters in the major leagues over the last 10 years, Jose Cruz. A yellow hammer 0 and 2 to Jose Cruz. What a curveball from Gooden. And Houston picked up Cruz. I believe it was 25,000, maybe $20,000. Right. Yeah, that's right. 74. Pretty good investment, huh? Oh. It's $2,000 a year over the last 10 years. I think they've gotten that out of him. <laughs> he had 400 against the Mets last year and his lifetime batting average 287. He's had 134 home runs in his major league career. 
and obviously would have had more had he not been playing in the dome. Fastball got him. I said fastball. I think Gooden took a little bit off of that. So it was kind of, kind of a tweener ball, wasn't it? Well, here it is again. Cruz with that Melot kick up right there. He thought it was low, but no way it was low. Certainly a strike, seventh strikeout for Gooden, and after six and a half, the Mets trail by a squeaky one to nothing. Well, fans, Cap Day this year will be held on Sunday afternoon, May 19th, when the Mets meet the San Francisco Giants. All fans attending the 135 game will receive a free Mets cap courtesy of Baby Ruth and Butterfinger. And this year's cap is something special. It's all white with Mets in script across the crown. The cap cannot be bought at Shea or at any shop shopping center or any sporting goods store. So why not make it out to Shea on May 19th and get caps for the entire family? Tickets are on sale at the advanced ticket window at Shea, which is open seven days a week, or the very same ticket which can be bought right here at Shea. Well, they're available at all Ticketron outlets in the metropolitan area. And that's free white caps to all fans from Baby Ruth and Butterfinger. Sunday afternoon, May 19th, the Mets against the San Francisco Giants. Baby Ruth and Butterfinger, better than ever. Baby, Bo Baby Ruth and Butterfinger, both baseball names, right? <laughs> yes, they are. <laughs> completely you different terms. You don't want to be called Butterfingers, though. <laughs> You're oh, much babe preferred. is all right. <laughs> Well, here's a guy to lead off the bottom of the seventh that certainly doesn't have butterfingers. Won the gold glove seven times. Keith Hernandez, what a player he is. He's 0 for 1 this evening. He has walked, as Joe Necro has walked three Mets. Mets had a harmless single back in the fifth by Danny Heap, and that has been it. Necro has been superb. Knuckleball inside. 1 and 0 to Keith Hernandez. I would think that if anybody could be a good knuckleball hitter, it would be Keith Hernandez. Tom Gorman warming for the Mets. What a brilliant, valorous performance Tom Gorman put on on Sunday, huh? Seven innings and was a winning pitcher as the Mets won 18 innings. He closed out the game. 2-0 to Keith Hernandez. He'll probably get something other than a knuckleball here, Ralph. We'll see. See whether he gives in or not. Got a fastball. Base hit right field. Well, when you're a hitter, all you hope for is for the knuckleball pitcher to get behind, and then you hope to get a fastball or a slider. And that's exactly what Keith did. He was looking for other something other than the knuckleball and he got the fastball and drilled it to right so the Mets have the time run at first with no one out in the bottom of the seventh I have always said that that's the best way to hit it big deal so you give up a strike in the process you got two strikes but if you can be patient and make him throw a strike with that knuckleball and get behind then you can sit on something other than that pitch and that's what Hernandez did here's Clint Hurdle who entered the game in the fifth inning replacing Gary Carter whose bruised ribs are acting up knuckleball bunted off foul and if it's one thing tougher to do than hit a knuckleball it's the butt one Frank DePino the left-hander throwing in the bullpen for Houston that's a bad only two hits nobody out Hernandez at first one to nothing ball game Houston up Negro stepping off, trying to get Hurdle to commit himself too soon. Going to bunt again, and it's a foul tip as Ashby dropped the ball, but now it's 0-2 to Clint Hurdle. And right here, the knuckleball breaking under the bat. I, I don't even know if he fouled it. The catcher having a tough time trying to keep it in play near the catcher's box. It's 0-2 to Clint Hurdle. Strawberry on deck. Base hit center field. What a piece of hitting by Clint Hurdle. 
Everybody here at Jay glad he failed <laughs> in the bun attempt. Well, the only way you can make up for not coming through with the sacrifice is to follow it up with a two-strike base hit. Hurdle fought it off, and he pushed it out over the shortstop's head. It's a knuckleball. Didn't break too much that time. Got a break there. And the Mets now have Hurdle at first base and Hernandez down at second. Now what do you do, Mr. Kiner, with Daryl Strawberry? Do you have him bunting with Heap on deck? Can't have him bunt. He's got the hit away. Okay. Daryl 0 for 2 on the night. He was called out on strikes in the second and flied out to left in the fourth. In the first inning of Sunday's game, Daryl Strawberry hit his first Grand Slam home run ever. And in the 18th inning, he got a big base hit to move Mookie Wilson to third. Mookie eventually scoring the winning run. They're looking for the bunt. Oh, baby, what a hitter's delight. Walling way in at first base. Can't figure that one. He's going to give that hard shot to Daryl Strawberry as he stays in front. See if he stays up there again. Darrell had a mighty swing but missed it. 0-1 to Strawberry. Walling still in at first base. Man. Swing and a, get and a miss. 0-2 to Darrell Strawberry. Arch, you've had two cracks at him. Now you cut down on your swing. That's one thing that Darrell has not learned to do yet. You have to get defensive now, and especially with a breaking ball pitcher or a knuckleball pitcher. Rockets one toward left. It's foul. Still 0-2 to Strawberry. Gosh, when you talk about the tremendous ability of this young man, you forget that he's 23 years old, don't you? George Foster. Like he's been around a while. Yeah. And he has. Third year in the major leagues. He now has 58 home runs. Short career, as you saw George Foster on deck and Bob Lillis looking on. Ball is outside one and two to Daryl Strawberry. And when you're a base runner in this situation, you have to be really alert and, and make sure you get out because anytime this ball can be a pass ball or a wild pitch. He got under it. Had a good swing. Jerry Mumphrey, the center fielder, in and he makes the catch. Not deep enough for Hernandez to move to third base. So there's now one away. One to nothing Astros. The Mets with three hits. And the Astros with only four off Dwight Gooden. Foster 0 for 1 on the night. He has walked and struck out. Tough assignment. And Joe Negro. 13 and 8 against the Mets. 2.62 ERA lifetime against New York. Knuckleball inside. Nice play, Ashby. He really does a good job fighting that one. He does a good job, doesn't he? Hate to be known as a knuckleball pitcher catcher. <laughs> That's a job you don't want. They hit left field. Hernandez may try to score. Here he comes. Boom, throw. Drop the ball at home plate. Alan Ashby had the ball, and Hernandez bearing down on him. It's now a one-to-one -one ball game as both runners move up. Well, there will be an error charged on the play. Ashby had Hernandez. There was no doubt about it. Jose Cruz with a strong throw. It comes in on the fly. Watch Cruz. He gets into good throwing position, makes an extremely accurate throw from a tough spot. <coughs> and now the ball rises ahead of Hernandez, but the ball is knocked out of the glove. Hernandez touched home plate as he went over it. He does go back to touch it again to make sure. Right here, another angle, and the ball beats Keith Hernandez. He's got him dead to rights. The ball in that big glove, and it's hard to hold on to that ball. It's more of a blocking glove than anything else. 
And that's exactly what happened there. You know, I think that's a key point, Ralph, because what a catcher tries to do in a situation like that, if he has time, is to get the ball out of the glove. And I don't think Ashby, I think when he went in there, couldn't I, find I couldn't find the ball. So he had to make the tag with the catcher's mitt. And if there's one thing worse than trying to block that ball with, the, with that big catcher's mitt, it's trying to make a tag on a runner. You don't know where the ball is. There's no feel to the ball. And Joe Negro working on an outstanding ball game is reached by the Mets here in the seventh inning. Let's take a look at that play one more time as we have plenty of time here. And the big glove. Oh, the throw is perfect. And he's got plenty of time. Doesn't look like he ever had the bare hand on it. It was in the other. He was in the glove, but he never could find it with his bare hand to secure it in there. As you said, it's more of a blocking glove, and I think that's a, a very good explanation for it. Boy, a tough way to go out of a ball game. Actually, the runner thrown out at home would have been two out, no one scoring, and a one nothing game in favor of Houston, but that play right there gave the Mets a chance to tie it, and Necro out of the game, and everybody on the bench, on the Met bench, really happy about that, no matter who they bring in. That's right. On that play, Foster, who had stopped at first, moved on down to second, so there should be an error charge for that alone. Yeah, there's no error given, but even if it's not, I agree with you, even if it's not charged on the tag play or the potential tag play at home plate, the fact that Foster had stopped and moved to second base after he dropped the ball should constitute an error. Foster should not have stopped because the throw was way over the head of the cutoff man. He had no chance at all to cut it off. Well, we got a new pitcher also, Mr. Kiner, left-hander Frank DePino. DePino with a record of one win and two losses, an earn run average of 3.48. This is his 10th ball game. He's worked 10 and one-third innings, given up seven hits. He has walked just three. And he has struck out five. Frank DePino throwing left-handed well you're seeing a ball game with a lot of action and this amazing Met action continues tomorrow night at 7 15 when the battle rages on with the Astros don't miss Bob Nepper and Ron Darling dueling it out then at 10 30 the generals 85 recaps this week this week's matchup against Orlando what a lineup tomorrow only on Sports Channel you can check your local listings in New England Right here, we'll take a look at the cutoff man making a high jump, but this ball's way over his head, so Foster should have gone on. Not even close. There you see the cutoff man. No chance. He fakes it, but if you're looking, you can tell the difference when that ball's that high in the air. So the Mets tied on that play, and now the batter will be Danny Heap, who had the first Met hit. Danny one for two, infield in for the Astros. One to one game. Slider is outside. Danny entered the game batting 217. In there for the ailing Mookie Wilson as Strawberry has moved to center and Heap has played right. Pitch out. Interesting call. 1 0 with the count. They were looking for the squeeze play there. You know, Bob Lillis likes to squeeze a lot too, and a lot of times managers will make the mistake of thinking other managers think the same way they do. <laughs> and it's the same way. I don't like the squeeze in this spot. You've got two runners in scoring position with the infield in. Got a chance to blow the game open. Fastball up and in. Almost blew Danny Heap open with that pitch. 3-0. and oh. This was right under the chin as he passed to hang against the curveball, and he's late getting out of the way, but he did. And it's three balls and no strikes, and he will not get anything good to hit here. Rafael Santana on deck. They do end up walking heap. I would imagine they'll bring a right-hander in to face Santana. He got the green light there. That's not a bad play. I like it. Let him hack. Give him a chance to lay for the fastball, and if he gets it, then go ahead and swing away. You're looking for more than just one run here. Joe Zambito, the ex-Astro, and Doug Sisk warming in the bullpen. And the Astros have a righty and a lefty up also. Frank DePino in relief of Joe Necro. Grounded base hit up the middle. 
George Foster broke back toward the bag, but even had he broken toward third, he wouldn't have had a chance to score with Mumphrey's strong arm. Good piece of hitting by Danny Heath. The Mets lead three, make that two to one. Well, Danny Heath, the former Astro, coming through with a big base hit. I'm surprised he got a fastball to hit here. And he gets a fastball and hits it up the middle. Foster, you see, breaking back to the bag. He did not know where the shortstop was. And now he can only go over to third as the go-ahead run comes in to score. Now Mookie Wilson is going to third base to run for George Foster. Davey Johnson thinking that there's going to be a defensive change anyway, so why not get Mookie in for the extra speed at third? Foster with the game-tying RBI, the base hit to left field off Joe Necro. So Heap at first base, Wilson at third, one out, Santana the batter. Now you might have the squeeze, Ralph. Santana hitting eighth in the batting order. Grounded toward second. There's one. Good pick by Denny Walling to get Rafael Santana. So the Mets are out here in the seventh inning, but they take the lead. Well, this pickup by Walling at first base is not an easy play. How he came up with that backhand pickup. Well, he did, and that's all that counts. And it gets Houston out of the inning. But the Mets take the lead in the seventh with two runs on four hits. They stranded a runner. They now lead two to one going into the eighth inning. Well, defensively for the New York Mets, Danny Heap has moved from right field to left field. And John Christensen sporting that new number seven is in right field and number seven was retired by the Crosstowners. Pretty good ball player as number seven, huh? Eddie Greenpool. Eddie and Greenpool, and of course, Joe Sambino picked up number 35, the number that John Christensen was wearing because that's the number he's used in his major league career. I was really referring to Michael Mantle, who wasn't, oh, that who one. wasn't, oh, yeah. who wasn't a bad another player. Ball. That's another <laughs> story. <laughs> well, Jerry Mumphrey will lead off against White Gooden. Gooden has retired everybody on strikes in the lineup with the exception of Walling, Ashby, and Reynolds. And, of course, the pitcher, Joe Necro. The fastball is high. The Mets lead 2-1. to one. Gooden has seven strikeouts. Striking out over 15, 15 or, or 10 or more last year, 15 times. Swing and a miss, 1-1. One and one. He has done it this year only once in his second outing against the Reds. The doctor struck out 10. Cutting out Cincinnati. This fastball sails over the head of catcher Clint Hurdle. Two and one to Mumphrey. This ball gets away, and boy, that thing up there really goes. It's taken off right on up. Very few pitchers can maintain the velocity on a pitch that's low as compared to a high pitch. That's right, that's your release point. And there it was right there, two and two to Mumphrey. You can have action on your pitches down, but most of your action, especially for power pitchers, are balls that are up. Two and two to Jerry Mumphrey. Grounded toward third. Howard Johnson, a tricky hop. He throws out Mumphrey, one away. A lot of times when you're in that close, that ball fools you, doesn't it, Ralph? Yeah, he had a little trouble with that. It had some spin on it, and then he fires it over, over to first base. He has a strong arm. One of the impressive things about Howard Johnson is how well he's played defense. He has been off to a slow start with the bat, but he has stuck with it defensively. Here's Phil Garner. Speaking of stick to itness, he certainly has it. He's 0 for 2. He has K'd twice. Breaking ball high, 1 and 0. Gooden has got him both ways. He struck him out on the curveball in the second inning and a fastball in the fifth. Oh, a little chin music for Phil and Ed Burton. 2 and 0 to Phil Garner. The way he moved in on that ball looked like he was looking curved. 
You're watching all the action right here on Sports Channel, live from Shea Stadium. I'm Tim McCarver, along with Ralph Kiner and Fran Healy. As the Nets took the lead in the bottom of the seventh, Joe Necro stands to lose this game unless the Astros can come back in the next five outs. 3-0 to Phil Garner. Looks like a different person without that mustache. He's picked up about five years on his age look. Young kid now. Mm -hmm. I think Healy had it right. He's got a. He's looking for a long-term contract. <laughs> that was a good line. <laughs> Three and one to Phil Garner. There was a time when ball players used to take two or three years off their age, but they can't do that now with a pension plan. That's right. Foul tip. So it's now three and two to Phil Garner. Glenn Hurdle came in the game in the fifth inning for the injured Gary Carter. This ball is fouled back and it hits Wendelstaff. Boy, he took a blow right there. That ball's going 95 miles an hour. Another fastball fouled away, so Garner stays tough. Garner came to the Houston Astros back in 1981 for Randy Neiman, the left-handed pitcher. And Johnny Ray, the fine Pirates second baseman. So the Astros were going for that pennant drive back then in the split season. And Pittsburgh didn't think they could sign Phil Garner, right. so they said, okay, you take him. And then the Astros had to sign him and did. Three and two to Phil Garner. Fouls off another one. Still got a business degree from the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. Played basketball in college also. Quite an athlete. Let's see, how did he play basketball? He's a short fellow. Mm -hmm. but Dick Groat was an All-America basketball player. He wasn't any taller than Bill Garner. Dick, of course, going to Duke University. And a curveball fouled away. So Garner really stayed alive on a tough pitch there. 3-2 curveball, he was able to get the bat in the ball. That tells you that he can stay, he can hang in there. On deck batter, Alan Ashby, the catcher. Fast ball up and in. So Garner in a feisty at bat. Takes first base via a base on balls route. First walk given up by Dwight Giddon. And the batter is going to be Alan Ashby. Ashby's got power. He has one home run this year. Had four last year. Uh-huh. Shortened season. Had 12 two years ago for the Astros. He has five home runs lifetime against the Mets. It's always hit Met pitching very well. 296 lifetime average against New York. Did he go? No, says third base umpire Jerry Davis. And it's 1-0 and to Alan Ashby. Right here, we'll take a look at the check swing. Fastball up there, I'd say he held up. Kind of a funny thing, Ralph. Last year, he batted 304 as a left-hander. 203 as a left as a right-handed batter. So 100 points difference. Much stronger left-handed hitter. But this year, he's batting 208 left-handed and 358 right-handed. <laughs> How do you figure the game? Garner not running, and Ashby swings through a high fastball, one and one. I would think they would have tested Clint Hurdle's arm before now. They haven't. Garner, a good base runner at first base. Hurdle has a good arm, as was attested to by throwing out a runner from left field. Just a matter of what kind of a release he can get. He's new to catching. Yeah, it's different catching and throwing the ball than it is when you can wind up as an outfielder. Grounded toward first. Hernandez gets one. Back to first with good cover. And what a double play. Three to six to one. 
Well, there are three players that make good plays on this. Hernandez making the pickup and perfect throw. Santana gets it away so quickly. And Gooden coming off the mound is over there where it's an easy play for him. He started right off the mound the minute that ball was hit. And that's what makes this play. Gooden, a great athlete. A dandy double play turned by the Mets to end the eighth. And after seven and a half, it's two to one New York. The Mets take on the Wild West, but Houston rides in the shade. Don't miss the action. The Mets and Astros Wednesday at 7.15, only on Sports Channel. A hand of approval here for Dwight Gooden. He has a two to one lead, bottom of the eighth inning. He is 0 for 1. He's popped to the catcher and walked. Good hitting pitcher facing Frank DePino in relief of Joe Necro. There's a strike, one and one. Pino came to the Houston Astros with Kevin Bass and Mike Madden for Don Sutton back in 1982. Don Sutton has moved from the Milwaukee Brewers now to the Oakland A's and is doing well with Oakland. Two and one to Dwight Gooden. signed out of a tryout camp by Milwaukee. That's rather unusual. Well, really unusual, but, but it wasn't unusual 20 years ago, was it? No. White Gooden gets on there as Capino issues his first walk. He entered the game with runners at second and third in the seventh inning and one man out. And Danny Heap with a clutch base hit up the middle drove in the go-ahead run. Wally Backman. 0 for 2, he is grounded to first and grounded to second. And sacrifice back in the third inning. Yeah, he's in the sacrifice situation right here. Especially from the right side, wouldn't you say? Yes. Not had a hit right-handed this year. and Batted under 200 last year right-handed. <laughs> He'll probably try to push it towards first base with Walling holding Gooden at first. He is bunting, but the fastball is outside. 1-0 oh to back. Wally, 6 for 37 last year is a left-handed, against left-handed pitching. Batting 162. Fouls this one off. Or did he foul it off? Harry Wendelstead said yes, and Alan Ashby ran after it. How about that, sports fan? Ashby didn't know it was a foul tip. That's amazing, isn't it? Kind of weird. Here's another look at it. Ashby tears off. He thinks it's a pass ball or wild pitch. <laughs> what a great shot that That's was. That's a great shot. Umpire not calling the foul tip, Harry, and, until Ashby started after. Anyway, it's still one and one to Wally Backman. Gooden at first. And he went to Bunn again, squaring around, and this ball caught the corner, so it's one and two to Backman. Calhoun, the left-hander, and Solano, the right-hander, warming up. Heard all sorts of good things about that Solano with that split-finger fastball. Slider is high to Backman. So it's two and two to Wally Backman. <laughs> Tap toward third. Garner will have to hurry. Good play. Good play, Phil Garner. Gooden on the play, moving to second base. So in effect, the sacrifice worked. And right here, Garner has to get off a fast throw to get that ball over there in time. Good hustle by Backman. Top that ball. This ball might have gone foul. Garner doesn't think so. He's not going to take that chance, and he picks up the out at first base on a very good play. 
again, the batter is going to be ex Houston Astro, Ray Knight. Batting for Howard Johnson. Johnson 0 for 3 on the evening. So Ray Knight in there. Ray came to the New York Mets last September. Batting only 188 this year, but he's only been up 16 times. And he takes a slider for a strike. Two to one ball game. Mets are on top, bottom of the eighth. Dwight Gooden against Joe Necro, and Frank DePino has relieved Necro. So it's Necro's game to lose and DePino's game to win as we stand. Fastball tap foul, so Knight's in the hole, 0-2. Ray Knight came from the Astros to the Mets August 28th of last year for pitcher Mitch Cook, infielder Manny Lee, and the outfielder Gerald Young. So a three-for-one trade. Slider misses, one and two to Ray Knight. Pino had 20 saves two years ago with the Astros. Fine young left-hander. Born in Syracuse, New York. Swing and a miss. Knight goes down on the slider. That's a good pitch here. He gets it in on the inside part of the plate and Ray right over the top of it. And the strikeout. The second out here in the eighth. And Pino will pitch to Keith Hernandez. Keith Hernandez is going to be the batter, and they're going to walk Keith. Clint Hurdle, the on-deck batter. He got a big base hit in the seventh inning. Did it after he failed to sacrifice. Had a two-strike count, single to center field to get the Mets going. scored two runs in the seventh. The only Astro run coming in the first inning on Denny Walling's first home run of the year. Second one yielded off Dwight Gooden. I think that's one of the more amazing things about Gooden. He gave up only seven home runs last year. The lowest amount yielded in the National League. The type of guy who throws that riding fastball that would give up a lot of home runs. You take a Robin Roberts who threw a riding fastball. He used to give up 38, 40 home runs a year. Uh-huh. Not many when it counted, though. Robbie, I was going to say, Robbie <laughs> gave up a lot of home runs in those 9-1 games. That's right. <laughs> Hurdle one for one. Takes a slider for a strike. Well, his first at bat was against a tough knuckleballer, Joe Necro, and now he's faced a left-hander, Frank DePino. Nobody said it'd be easy, did they? And he's answered the call both times. Gooden will try to score. Bass with a strong arm. Three to one, New York. And once again, it's White Gooden showing his athletic ability. He runs well. He throws well. He hits pretty well. And right here, he comes around as the Mets get another insurance run. And let's look at it again. Here's the base hit by Hurdle. Low fastball. Hit hard to right field. Bass with a good arm. Gets to it in a hurry. Gooden has to hustle, and he makes a good slide. Beats the tag. So Gooden helping his own cause as we look at it from this angle. Hurdle doing a good job of trying to get the cutoff man to cut that ball off. Continuing and going on down base. to second base. Very good base running. Outstanding point, Ralph. You're willing to uh, have him cut that ball off trying to get you to get that run in. Hurdle just kept on going around those bases. Very fine baseball. And a tight ball game in late innings, you're always willing to take the run and exchange an out. Jerry Walker, the pitching coach, out to talk to Frank DePino. The doctor will have a chance to catch a breather here. And what can you say about Clint Hurdle? 
after that remarkable game he played on Sunday and coming back tonight as a catcher and coming up with two key base hits. Well, he's had determination. He said in the pregame interview that he always considered himself a good athlete. Now they're going to walk Daryl Strawberry. Probably walk Strawberry and, and bring in the right-hander, Solano, I would think. See what manager Bob Lillis decides to do. This will be the third walk in this inning for the Mets. This one, of course, intentional. Strawberry in the ball game, 0 for 3. Brought an eight-game hitting streak into the game, so that's in jeopardy. So kind that of, loads the bases. Kind of unusual to walk the left-hander unless you're going to bring the right-hander in, but now that's respect right there. <laughs> well, they want to take on the young ball player, the rookie. John Christensen in his first at bat in this game. Who is hitless on the season. So evidently Bob Lillis is doing his homework. He's been reading the stat sheet. John Christensen 0 for 17 on the year looking for that first big hit. Swing and a miss at a low fastball. So DePino ahead of John Christensen. You don't see that too often. A left-handed pitcher walking a left-handed hitter intentionally to get to a right-hander. Bases loaded, two out. Three to one, New York. And Christensen had a good pitch to hit there, but he missed it. Fouled it back, so it's 0-2 to John. Jerry Walker, the pitching coach of the Astros, with the listening to the eye in the sky. Why would a pitching coach be wearing that? He's not responsible for moving outfielders around, is he? I don't know how they handle that. They got enough coaches over there to start a school. <laughs> oh, and two to Christensen. Grounded off the leg of DePino, and it's going to be a base hit. John Christensen with his first hit of the 1985 season, and it couldn't have come at a better time. Four to one, New York. look at it again it's a smash right through the middle it hits DePino on the leg and caroms off to the first base side DePino can't get going after the ball hit him and so he can't cover and the Mets get a run there you see the action DePino did a good job of getting started after that ball hit him but it's just not enough for him to get over there ahead of John Christensen so the first hit of the year for Christensen an RBI and the Mets now lead by three new number I guess did the trick yeah that's right Joe Zampito was traded was purchased by the no well, actually was signed by the New York Mets and his number with Houston was 35 so John Christensen rolled the lucky seven huh as he's wearing number seven for his first major league base hit and the Astros now have made a move Going to bring in a new pitcher with the score four to one, New York leading. The Mets now with seven hits, and the Astros with only four. Another left-hander. Well, the Mets have Danny Heap coming up next. So Danny, who contributed a big base hit in the seventh inning tie up the ball game and it's going to be Jeff Calhoun coming in Calhoun born in LaGrange Georgia signed as an Astro third round selection in the June 1980 draft he's been in the major leagues for 30 days he has a record of no wins no losses and one save high ERA of 5.14 Jeff Calhoun Last year at Houston, he was 0-1 with no saves. Appeared in nine ball games, all in relief. <laughs> so with the young left-hander, Jeff Calhoun, we'll take a look at the scores in the National League. Chicago over San Francisco, 3-1. That's the final, of course, at Wrigley. 11 to nothing. The Phillies thumping those Expos now in the sixth inning. 
six to two Pittsburgh over San Diego in the bottom of the eighth. St. Louis one to nothing over the Los Angeles Dodgers and Atlanta over Cincinnati eight to three. So a tough time for the Western teams of the National League tonight. Pittsburgh winning, Philadelphia winning, St. Louis winning, and Chicago having won. All the Eastern teams in the National League have beaten the West. The Mets, by the way, 44 and 28 against the Western Division teams last year. So Danny Heap up there. Danny with two base hits. He got the first hit of the game in the fifth inning and a big RBI his last time up to drive in the Go ahead run against Frank DePino. Base is still loaded. Two out. Mets up four to one. He's trying to put it away. Good slider there. Did he go? Yes, says third base umpire Jerry Davis. And I agree with it. One and one to Danny Heap. Swing and a miss at a fastball. LaGrange, Georgia is the home of Jeff Calhoun. There you see the bases loaded with Metropolitans, no place to put heat. Fly ball, left field, Jose Cruz over, and he makes the catch. So Jeff Calhoun does the job, but the Mets come back with two runs on two base hits. There were no errors, and the Mets stranded three and lead four to one going into the top of the ninth. Top of the ninth inning, last chance for the Astros. They're doing against doing it against one of the most formidable pitchers in the National League, Dwight Gooden. Craig Reynolds will try to get something started for the Astros as Gooden gave up a two-out bases empty home run to Dennis Walling in the first inning, and that has been it for the Astros. They have had three harmless hits since then. Ganey is the on-deck batter, swinging from the left side. Ty Ganey. Good first name, huh? Uh -huh. I defy you to pronounce his real name. Telmanch, isn't it? Telmanch, Tell -manch, I guess. T-E-L-M-A-N-C-H, Telmanch Ganey. Jesse Orozco, just in case the doctor needs help. The doctor has not only made house calls, he's made night calls. He was 16 and four at night last year with a 1.56 ERA. One and one to Craig Reynolds. I really don't think there's anything in that. I think it's just the fact that he happened to have pitched well at night over and above daytime. In the long run, I think it'll even out. Pop up. Clint Hurdle will try it. Knight is in, and Hurdle makes the catch. Good play by Clint Hurdle. Here's a guy used to coming in on balls, and now as a catcher, he's got to spin around and try to catch well, it. Well, he turned around and caught it like he would from the outfield. Which is the best way to right. try to catch it. That ball has an awful lot of spin on it, and it curves back. And if, you, uh -huh. if you're going to catch it with your back to the backstop and your face to the outfield, you got to let that ball get behind you and it spins back into in front of you. Can't uh, go too far under that ball, otherwise you'll be doing a cartwheel back in the infield. Well, here's Ty Ganey or Tell Manch Ganey. From Shiraw, South Carolina. He swings and misses at a Dwight Gooden fastball. He's making the jump from double A into the major leagues. He played in Columbus actually the last two years, batted 276 with 13 home runs last year for Columbus. He could fly at 39 stolen bases last year. He was signed as a second round selection in the June 1979 free agent draft. 
This is his first time in the majors this year. He has been hitless in two trips so far, both as pinch hitters, of course. His third trip will be a memorable one. <laughs> memorable one. one and two. Gooden has seven strikeouts. He's walked only one. National League leader in strikeouts coming into this game. Mario Soto at 36. Soto will be pitching against the Mets on Friday night at Riverfront in Cincinnati. Soto with 36, De Leon with 35, and Valenzuela with 35 strikeouts. Fastball is low, so it's two and two. To Ty Ganey. Got a strange batting stance. Picks up that front foot. Puts it on the ball of his foot rather than the heel down. What was it? Whitfield did that? Terry Whitfield. Terry Whitfield. Hit that way. Yeah, nice going. Terry still with the Dodgers. Fastball got him, and Ganey knew it. Eighth strikeout for Dwight Gooden. Two out. Last chance is going to be Bill Doran, the second baseman. And this is strikeout number 34, so Dwight moving up to within two of Mario Soto. <coughs> and a chance to pick up one more. Doran on the evening is 0 for 3, and he has been a strikeout victim of Dwight Gooden. This one misses low, 1 and 0 to Bill Doran. I would imagine Doran will be taking a strike. If I know Bob Lillis. Lillis a shortstop with Houston when they started in 1962. His fastball is low, 2 and 0. Yeah, he was traded to the St. Louis Cardinals back in 61 in the Gino Simoli trade. He was, came to the Cardinals with Carl Warwick, who also ended up in Houston. Not a bad hitter, Carl Warwick. Fastball inside, 3-0, so you'll be able to see Doran take a couple of pitches. Carl Warwick had three pinch hits in the 64 series. Cardinals won over the Yankees, three for three, and that tied a record. Tim McGarver was the catcher in that ball club. Uh huh. This fastball misses low, so four straight balls to Bill Doran and the batter Kevin Bass. And you don't want to put him on because then you have the long ball threat of Dennis Walling. For that reason, a Roscoe gets back up. That's an unlikely performance for Dwight Good. First walking the batter in four pitches, and second in that situation, just walking the batter, period. Yeah, he had walked only eight coming into this game. Last year, he walked only 73 in 218 innings. A little more than two a game. Breaking ball is a strike. How about that? He just walked the batter in four pitches, and he starts off with a curveball. Comes ball. back with Uncle Charlie, huh? <laughs> a lot of times, a catcher can use that that philosophy, I don't know if Hurdle was doing it, but you can use that philosophy to, to bring a pitcher back into the groove with a fastball. And there's the groove, 0-2. I know that sounds strange, Ralph, but sometimes the breaking ball can make a pitcher extend and get him back to pitching, you know, his normal game again. And follow down through uh -huh. instead of releasing up too high exactly. and not following through. Right. 0-2 to Kevin Bass. 33,000 on their feet at Shea. Breaking ball, tap toward first, it's foul. <laughs> so you'll hear the crescendo of a semi-feverish pitch building again here at Shea. 0-2 to bat. single to center field off White in the seventh inning off a breaking ball. Kevin one for three on the evening. Fly ball right center field. Christensen over. This ball should be caught and is by Daryl Strawberry. For the Astros in the ninth inning. No runs. No hits. There were no errors. 
And one man left. And after this ball game, Dwight Gooden is now three and one, striking out eight, walking only two. The line score on the game, one run, four hits, no errors for the Astros. Four runs, seven hits, and one error for the Mets. Winning pitcher Dwight Gooden is now three and one, the loser and a tough loser, I might add, Joe Necro. His record is now one and three. Ralph and I will be back with the recap right after these words. Well, the New York Mets won it by a score of four to one behind the fine pitching of Dwight Gooden. Only four hits for the Houston Astros. Dwight giving up the one run in the first inning on a home run by Dennis Walling, who's been a red hot batter for Houston. Mets got back in the ball game and they scored two runs in the seventh inning. Hurdle contributing with a big base hit after trying to bunt Hernandez over and failing to do so came through with a base hit in the center field moving Hernandez down to second and then Hernandez came in the score on base hit by George Foster and then on a close play at the plate on the base hit by Danny Heap the run scored that put the Mets on top the ball arrived before the runner but on the play the catcher dropped the ball and the Mets got in top and got on top when they scored their second run of the ball game they added two more runs in the eighth inning and closed it out with a win Four to one. Good now three and one in the ball game, and Joe Necro a tough loss. He went six in the third innings, gave up two runs on four hits while striking out four and walking three. Necro now with a record of one and three. So the Mets have won the first game against Houston this year, and they have one more to play tomorrow night. I think the, uh, one of the unsung heroes tonight, certainly Clint Hurdle, the other Danny Heap. I think Clint Hurdle is becoming the 1985 edition of Davey Johnson's trip from the minor leagues for. A, a more established player. Last year, if you remember, it was Wally Backman and Ron Gardenhire, uh, and this year it's Clint Hurdle. There are some guys in the minor leagues that Davey Hurdle managed, or Davey Johnson managed in the minor leagues, and uh, certainly uh, uh, managing those players, he knew their ability, and he has stuck with those guys, and they owe him a great deal of, of thanks, and that thanks is, uh, is really being uh, shown right here on your screen. Clint Hurdle, the winning catcher tonight. And the other catcher, Gary Carter, having to leave the game with bruised ribs. And uh, Carter in the ball game contributing again defensively. He picked a runner off at second base, a very big play back in the third inning, and then threw a runner out attempting to steal in that same inning in the third. So a very good effort by Gary Carter defensively as he left the ball game. He incidentally is going to have precautionary x-rays taken tomorrow to see whether or not those ribs are cracked. They don't believe that that's the case, but... Uh, after Sunday's ball game, it's a wonder he's still standing. Boy, that's so true. And uh, Sunday, a great ball game that went 18 innings and the Mets winning 5-4. to four. And Danny, he played a good game on Sunday. And tonight, he really delivered the game-winning RBI under unusual circumstances against Frank DePino on a 3-1 count. He drilled a single back through the middle to score uh, the go-ahead run in the seventh inning. And then it was, it was all over because the doctor was pitching. <laughs> the doctor was pitching, and we'll be back in just a moment with more of the wrap-up right after this commercial message. Well, the Mets won it by a score of four to one. They keep pace with the Cubs, who defeated San Francisco by a score of three to one. They're tied for first place. Highlights of the ball game, well, for the Houston Astros, mainly coming in the first inning. For Houston, Denny Walling, after two men are out, one a strikeout, picks up this fastball and hits it off the right field wall, and it's in the ballpark for a home run. Do I give him up his second home run of the year? Then Gooden gets his act together after this home run by Walling, his first of the season. He strikes out first batter here, Cruz. Then he gets the next batter, Cruz again, and now half swing by Gardner, and he is struck out. Bill Dorn is the next batter, and he is struck out. So right there, Gooden getting four of his eight strikeouts in the ball game. A good move to first base, and Gooden picks off a runner at first, Kevin Bass. That was in the seventh inning. Houston leading by a score of one nothing. Now here in the bottom of the seventh, Hernandez singles to right field. That starts off the inning. Hurdle is the next batter, and he singles after failing to bunt, and he moves Hernandez down to second base. So the Mets have the time run at second base in the form of Keith Hernandez. Now George Foster, and he drills this ball to left field. Jose Cruz makes a great throw. The throw beats the runner to the plate, but the ball is knocked out of the glove of Alan Ashby, and the Mets go in front by a score of 2-1 to one on the slide and touch of home plate by Keith Hernandez. Now following that up, Danny Heap singles off the left-hander to 
Pino, and he singles in another run. And the Mets come up with the insurance run that puts them ahead by a score of three to one. And right here, Dwight Gooden uses his speed and his hustle to score the final run of the ball game. And the Mets are leading by a score of four to one. Good job by Gooden as he hustles on that ball. And right here, no chance for a play at first base. And Hernandez comes in to score. So the Mets coming up with a big win here in their first game against the Houston Astro. And that is the final out of the inning as Kevin Bass flies out to center fielder Daryl Strawberry. And the Mets now will go against Houston for the final game of this two-game series and final game of the homestand tomorrow, after, tomorrow evening. So the final score of this game, the New York Mets four, the Houston Astros one. All right, Ralph Kiner, just a reminder, Tomorrow at 7.15, Mets action continues when the battle rages on with the Astros after the Super Bowl game tonight. And then tomorrow night at 10.30, the Generals 85 recaps this week's matchup with Orlando. So until tomorrow, this is Tim McCarver for Ralph Kiner and Fran Healy saying so long and thanks for watching Mets baseball on Sports Channel. We've got New York sports covered. Good evening, everybody. Mets baseball has been brought to you by Budweiser. For all you do, this Bud's for you. By Toyota, who reminds you to buckle up and use child safety seats. It's a good feeling. By Manufacturers Hanover, the financial source worldwide. By the Buick Somerset, see a car that will move you, a price you can deal with. Believe it. And by TWA, leading the way, TWA.